the highest impact a church can have is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. The highest impact a church can have is to make disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. I'll say it one more time. The highest impact a church can have is to make disciples, to make followers of Jesus Christ. The reason I'm saying that is this. When Jesus was raised from the dead, we see the account in Matthew chapter 28. And we understand that he told, he gave the directive to, directive to make disciples. And what I'm concerned about is we, the church, have done everything else except make disciples. We've learned how to do everything. When the truth of the matter is, when it boils down to it, the reason, let me just say it like this, the reason I can be a good husband is because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. If I find that I'm having difficulty in an area of my life, it's because somewhere I'm not following Christ. Because Christ shows me. He shows me what to do as a husband. He shows me what to do as a man. He is our, as Apostle Scales said, he is our model. He's the one that we follow. He's the one that we look after. So when we ask the question, what are the disciples? If I, if I gave the mic to everybody and said, what is a disciple? Man, we get so many answers that it's amazing. And so let's kind of synchronize and see what a disciple is. Of course, we know if you look at the word, it means it's a learner, it's a pupil. But it's more than a pupil. It is one, um, and I love the way Apostle Scales says it. He says it's one who emulates the life, nature, and character of Christ. Being a disciple involves being with him, being like him, following him, and making other disciples of him. Let me say that again. Being a disciple involves being with him, being like him, following him, and making other disciples of him. We have to ask, okay, why then? Why, why are we to make disciples? I'll tell you why we're to make disciples. We're to make disciples because it demonstrates obedience to Christ. I ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Verse number 18. Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When we, the reason we're making disciples is making a disciple demonstrates obedience to Jesus. Jesus' last command. Jesus' last command. This is the great commission, not the great omission. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, if Jesus' last command to us was to make disciples, is that a priority to us? Is his last command our first priority? And so when we, un- when we look at this and we say making a disciple, he didn't say go and, and make church members. Right. He didn't say go and make tithers. We should be members of a church. We should tithe. But he said go and make disciples. If I make a disciple, a disciple will obey him. If I make a disciple, a disciple will be a part of a local church. 
if I make a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so we, we, we're making everything else. And listen, my friend, we have measurables for everything else, but we don't have measurables for making disciples. So I can ask you uh, how many people you got in your choir. You know that, but how many people in the choir are disciples? Every disciple is a Christian, but every Christian is not a disciple. And so we have to make sure that, and and, and let me me just say it with me, I I had to make sure that I'm looking at Billy and say, Billy, are you really a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you, is your life uh, 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 emulating the life, nature, and character of Jesus Christ? Are you following him? Are you a learner? Are you a pupil? Are you a student of Jesus to the place where you are looking at him and receiving his life and becoming what he wants you to be? Is that happening in your life? And is it happening in every area of your life? I'll be the first to tell you, he's helping me. Look at somebody and say, he's helping me too. He's helping me. He's helping me. And so it demonstrates obedience to Jesus Christ. Let me give you this scenario. Suppose the parent um, left home and said, okay, what I need you to do uh, he's talking to the children and said, this is what I need you to do. I need talking to the children. I need you to make sure that you wash all of these dishes. Just wash the dishes. I mean wash all of them. Er, last one of them. <laughs> all right. Now, come home, uh, you know, and, and, it's, and, and they find out. And, and, and the children said, look, look, mom, dad, look, I, I vacuumed the floor. Mm. <laughs> I made up the bed. You know what else I did? I cleaned the windows. That little ring in the toilet, I got it out. <laughs> I, got, I did all of that. The question is going to be, did you wash the dishes? When Jesus comes, he's going to look at the church and ask us, did you make disciples. We, we, we built a building. We look at our building. We have the largest building in the city now. Our building is expansive. We have more land than Georgia. <laughs> but the question's still going to be, I appreciate all that, but did you make disciples? Well, we got the largest. Hey, hey we, we, we're mega. We're a mega church. Mega mammoth. We're not mega. We are mammoth. We are large and in charge. We have a TV ministry. We, we own the internet now. But did you make disciples? We have the baddest choir in town, but did you make disciples? We have the largest budget. Did you make disciples? Disciples, I'm preaching all over the town, Doc. Everybody calling me. I'm talking about, I, I, Doc, I, I mean, I got so many invitations. I, I, everybody's calling me. I had to turn down for My calendar is booked for about six years now. <laughs> but did you make disciples? And the question to us is, did you, are we making disciples? See, I believe God is It seems like this thing is kind of winding up in terms of time. And it seems like there's more of an urgency than there ever was. I don't know if if we have any kind of discernment. I believe we have the sense that the Holy Spirit is trying to do something, and he's trying to get us on assignment and off all of these sidetracks. Let me, let me hurry on. So, so when we say we, we make disciples because it demonstrates obedience to Christ, we make disciples because, listen, making disciples is the thing that transforms lives. Yes. Making disciples does. You remember over in Acts, Acts 4.13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Their lives were transformed because they had been with Jesus. They were changed. They were disciples. I want you to think about it. When Jesus gave the directive in Matthew chapter number 18, 
I mean, Matthew 28, 18 and 19 and following, he never told them how. He never, you don't see a how-to in there. He told them what to do, but he, you know, you should just go and teach them, do, just make disciples. The reason he could do that, because they walked with him three years. They walked with him three years, and as a result, their lives were changed. Making a disciple, when you become a disciple, your life is transformed. Also, making a disciple, listen to this, impacts the world. It transforms lives, but it, and when your life is transformed, that transformed life will impact the world. You know this particular scripture, you are the salt of the earth, but if a salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they, that they may see, that they may see, they may see your good work and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I, I, I want you, let me show you an illustration. Go, go, go to that next slide. See, this is what happens. People enter our church. Here's the world coming into the church. Unbelievers. And two, th- two options are happening. Let's just say, let's assume they got saved. Let's, let's, let's assume that, that we are offering them Christ when they come to our church. Okay, let's, let's assume. Let's assume that, they, that they're not unbelievers coming into church and leaving out unbelievers. But, but, but so they got saved. A couple of things are happening. Either they are going to be disciples and be salt and light, or they're going to be carnal Christians and no different than the world. So if you and I, when they are in our atmosphere, when they're in, in our churches, if they aren't being transformed, they go out the same way. As a result of them going out the same way, when we have to have elected officials, when we need this, guess who we're picking from? The people we sent out. So, listen, listen, listen. You're either, you and I are either being conformed to the image of Christ or being conformed to the world. You know the passage. Be not conformed, shaped into. Don't let the world shape you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But there's another conformed happening over in Romans chapter number eight when he says that that we are being conformed to the very image of Christ. In other words, God is looking at everything in our lives and he's cutting off everything that doesn't look like Christ. So it's happening. What's going on in our churches? We've got to make sure that we are making disciples. This is what I found out. If I gave you some water and gave you different containers, the water is going to take the shape of the thing you pour it into. So when people come to our churches, there's a certain shape that our churches have. And when they leave, they're going to be shaped like that, what they've been poured into. So what kind of vessels are we making when people come to our churches? When people come to our churches. You you said, Pastor, I wanted some inspiration this morning. Just hold on. You're going to get there in a minute. (laughs) And, and, And I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. When we're talking about forming them, spiritual formation, it is work. Paul told the church at Galatia, he said, my little children from whom I labor in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So we understand that, yes, we're to make disciples. We're to make disciples. So the question is, when we look at New Covenant, when we look at all those churches that were named, are we disciple-making churches? 
are we? Do we even care to be disciple-making churches? And if we don't care to be disciple-making churches, why are you a church? Watch out, sir. Why would you bear the name church, or, or excuse me, ministry, fellowship, whatever it is, and we not take on the, 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 the call and the mandate of the master. I'm going to tell you, can I, can I be transparent? I looked at New Covenant a few years back, and um, I realized, you know, God had blessed us and, and thanked the Lord for what he had done, but I just kept getting a getting something in my spirit. I go to prayer and, you know, it's like, Lord, something's going on. Um, what, what is it? What is it? What is it? And the Spirit of the Lord began to say, can you drop your agenda and pick up mine? And I don't believe I had a bad agenda per se, but maybe an uninformed one. I, I don't think I was malicious or trying to override him, but I didn't, I didn't hone in on what God was saying to us. And then we went through something called an extreme makeover. Yes. And what's amazing is I went up to Columbus, Ohio, not having talked to Apostle Scales, and I look up and I see makeover, and I went, Lord, I'm in the right place. I'm in the right place. And see, what I found out, the Holy Ghost will begin stirring your heart. He'll begin yes. stirring your heart because yes. he, he wants to shape you. He wants to do something yes. that's so unique, that's so, listen to me, that's so rooted in the scripture, so rooted in the Great Commission. You're talking about take some of that and you can holler, I got it, I got it, I got it. Yes. Those who will say, I am willing to be one of those disciple making church, Jesus, churches, Jesus said, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Wherever you go, I'm going to be with you. Everything you need, I'm going to give it to you to do what I ask you to do, what I've called you to do. The question is, are you going to get serious about it? Quit trying to be like the church down the street and be what God called you to be. So, all right, how can our churches, here we go, here we go. How can our churches become disciple-making churches? How, how, how can we do that? I want to give you a, little, a, a process that I believe is going to help us. All right. Here's the first thing. Everybody say evaluation. evaluation. Come on, say it again. Evaluation. evaluation. That means that we have to take an honest assessment of where we are. <coughs> so you, 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 you said, well, I'm not the pastor. Well, you might be the, 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 the usher. You might be whatever, you might be the choir member, but you have to look at it as, okay, what is the whole of the church? What is the full scope of what we're trying to do as a church? If the church knows what it's trying to do, then everybody on board, everybody in the church should know their part. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but we have to evaluate, take an honest assessment of where we are. Have you ever, um, do you remember life before GPS systems? You remember trying to go somewhere and you call somebody and go, uh, uh, I'm on my way to you, but I'm, I'm lost. And they're going to ask you what? Where are you? I'm, excuse me. Where you at? <laughs> where are you? Because in order for you to get where you need to be, you have to clearly define where you are. And ladies and gentlemen, this evaluation process is going to be enlightening. That's a good word, isn't it? It's going to be enlightening. It's going to shine the light on some things. And so we have to understand, we have to evaluate, listen to this, with independent eyes because it's difficult to take an honest assessment of your own church. It's difficult to take an honest assessment. Everything to you looks fine. There's a commercial called You've Gone Nose Blind. You know, they have all this trash in the car, cats and everything, I mean, all this kind of stuff in the car. And they said, you don't even smell it anymore because you're so used to it. 
and we go in our ministries because we're so used to it. You know, we're used to everybody messing up. So I'm functionally dysfunctional. Evaluation. Evaluation. So when we're talking about evaluating, we have to evaluate everything. Evaluate your mission statement. Let me give you an example. When we start doing this thing here at New Covenant, we had a mission statement, and it was called Making Ready a People Prepared for the Lord. Luke 1, chapter 17. I mean, Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And that's what we were on. Make ready, make ready, make ready. And you, and you know, and I, we, but, but the issue was this. We started asking people mm-hmm. around the church, and they could quote the mission statement. But then you ask for the interpretation. What, that, what does that mean? I get a different answer, 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 answer, because everybody was seeing it through their own eyes, from their own perspective, and really had no clear idea of what that meant. So, uh, we changed it. We said, let's go to the Great Commission and let his mission be our mission. His mission is making disciples. And so we said, what we're going to do, we, we're, we're transforming people into disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. Into fully devoted followers, fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. That's, that's what we're doing. Because we wanted to make sure that our mission was his mission. Yes. And I challenge you, if your mission doesn't line up with his mission, perhaps you, have, you don't have permission. And if you don't have permission, could it be that you don't have the authority to do everything that he's calling you to do and that thing that you were supposed to address, you don't have the authority to address it because you are not authorized. You are not representing fully his mission. They can't put, put a pilot on, a, on a, uh, these, these planes that, that, you know, bomb, and they're supposed to drop bombs and they say, you know, I think I want to drop it over here today. I think I want to do this today. So again, again, I got to hurry on through this. But there has to be evaluation. Evaluate your mission statement. Evaluate your vision. Do the people know where you're going? Evaluate your values. We took a team, a team of people uh, new to the church, old to the church, different age groups, and we began to see where we were in terms of values. We did a values assessment. And we found out that we had something called actual values and aspirational values. We say it, we said, yeah, we love, we, we, we're going to evangelize. But we weren't going anywhere and doing anything. On paper we said it, but we weren't, eva- we weren't doing anything. Let me, tell you, let me tell you what I found out about our church, about New Covenant. When I get up to give an invitation, Pastor Peterson, uh, uh, I, remember, I remember people would get more excited about somebody saying, I'm going to join the church as opposed to coming to faith in Christ. Thank God for new members and all that, but thank God for church transfer, et cetera. But hear what I'm saying. Hear what I'm saying? We got to make sure that we're evaluating the values. We're evaluating the, uh, uh, the, the church services. Are our services designed to make disciples? If people come into our services, will they know our intent? The choir singing about hell, ain't nobody going to hell. Whatever we say. And, and, and then the preacher gets up preaching, have faith in God. And then the usher is greeting people and said, come on, sit down. <laughs> and, and you know, and, and, and it's no cohesion, no cohesiveness about this thing. <laughs> because it isn't apparent what's going on in the church. Listen to me. Listen to me. We've got to evaluate our ministers. Do they see their role in making disciples? Their ministries and the departments, do they see their roles? We've got to evaluate the budget. Is the money saying we're making disciples? Because the church, listen to me, we can become so inward focused, it becomes about me, my, and I. We've got to evaluate our staff and leaders. Are they about making disciples? 
So there has to be a time of evaluation. Next, there has to be something called communication. Everybody say communication. communication. After you do the evaluation, there has to be communication. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Inform them. Tell them what you are doing. Meaning, if you're the leader, tell them what you're going to be doing. Tell them, tell them. I'm glad that when I get on a flight, they say, okay, this is a flight to Aruba. This is a flight to Hawaii. This is what we're going to be, we're going to be flying, we're going to fly this plane to Hawaii. Hold on, let's just meditate on Hawaii just for a minute. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So we have to inform the people. In terms of our communication, we have to give them information, but also we have to instruct them from the Word of God, communicate why you're doing it, because people resist change. You know, we've always done it like this. We always had the willing workers and the busy bees. All right? And so there has to be... Um, and we have to instruct them from the word, but then also we have to inspire them, communicate how everyone is going to benefit from us making disciples. That's a part of the communication. Listen, this is what I found out. If you are not tired of saying it, you've not said it enough. <laughs> you, just because you think you said it, let me give you an example. We, this, this very summit, we said, okay, registration is at this particular time, and it's going to cut off at this particular time, and we said it, 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 but people don't necessarily hear it. Every week we have uh, announcements, video announcements, on, and something has can be planned for four weeks, and then people call into the church. Um, and and who, I'm talking about people who were in the service. Yeah. <laughs> and you go, uh, what, uh, El, uh, Elder Margo, uh, is, it, is this going on? Uh, yeah, we're having church Sunday. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So I told you we have to evaluate, evaluation. This is a process. Then communication. We have to make sure that we communicate. I'll be, I'll be transparent with you. One of, my, one of the things that I did not do well enough is communicate. I wish I had communicated more, and I'm learning to communicate more. Uh, I figured you need to listen better, but I, <laughs> I found out that I really do need to communicate more and communicate better. And this is what I found out. You, 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 you have to say the same thing in different ways yes. because everybody has a different way of hearing. Yes. So when you're talking about changing the church into a disciple-making church, you know, why are we doing all that? I don't know why we got to make disciples. I just like coming to church and having me a good old time, praise Jesus. Get my praise on. You have to let them know, no, there's intentionality behind our services. We're here and you communicate those things. Okay, so listen, evaluation, communication, here's a tough one, elimination. This is how, how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to do it. Elim we have to eliminate those things that hinder or are not helping to make disciples. Let me give you something that happened. When we were in the office park, our church was located in the office park, and uh, at that time, Pastor Fred Caldwell was there, and and uh, we used to have coffee, and, but we had Sunday school. Then after it, we had um, coffee and, you know, maybe some donuts or something like that, uh, pastries. And it was a narrow space. So you come into, the way you get in, you come into the front door, and there was this little foyer area, two offices, and you had to go through the little foyer area around the little hallway to get to the sanctuary, which was in the back, right? <laughs> now, now. The donuts and everything were right there in the foyer area. So people would go to Sunday school, and then church was supposed to start at 11 o'clock. 
and they would finish Sunday school. And so we're waiting for church to start. At that time, Corey, I was playing the keyboards. And so I'm, you know, waiting on, you know, here we go. And I'm looking for my singers. I'm looking for everybody else. <laughs> that, that, I mean, they're drinking that last little bit of coffee. You know, let, let me throw this back real quick. And then let me, wait, 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 wait. Now, let me tell you, this is what happened. I said, it, this is go, our services are starting late. Things are getting ready to happen, and you know. And then I said, okay, we're going to cut the donuts out. We're not going to have the, have the donuts and the coffee. Apostle, you thought I would have said we'd have taken Jesus out of the church. <laughs> I said, we're going to eliminate that because it's defeating our purpose. Let's start on time. Because one of the things we do around here, we start, if I'm not here, they start. We don't wait on anybody. We start. And so, so, so what, what we, we wanted to do was make sure we start out. And it was like, I can't believe he took the donuts. <laughs> Man, he took the, it's like it's the only time I get to eat on Sunday morning. Oh, Jesus. Everybody say eliminate. eliminate. I'm telling you, when you get ready to start going through departments and doing the evaluation and all that, there has to be, it's going to be some elimination. If you're not eliminating, all you're doing is trying to put old, put new wine in old wine skins. That's all you're going to do. And Jesus said, it's going to burst. And, and understand, understand, it might be your favorite department, but if the favorite department isn't making disciples, why are we doing it? That's a big old question. <laughs> Everybody needs to have a, a so what? So what, person? After they finish everything that you do, and after you shouted and then prayed and then spoke in tongues and fell out on the ground, you have a big sign. So okay, so what? What's the end of all that? The end result of our doing all that we've done. What has it gone? What? Where? Ha- like Jeremiah said, he said, you know what? We're still not saved. <laughs> Jeremiah finds, you know what? We still ain't saved. Still, all, we've done all this stuff. We've shouted. We've laid hands on folk. We've prayed. We've anointed them with all. We've done everything. But let me tell you something. If we would communicate what we're trying to do in terms of making disciples, then it'll be easier to see. I need to eliminate that. I need to eliminate that. Come on. Say evaluation. evaluation. Communication. Communication. Elimination. Now, here's the next thing. Preparation. Preparation. You have to prepare yourself. You cannot operate the old way. Well, this is the way we used to do it. This this is what we've always done. I've been here all, uh, let me tell you, I've been in this church. I'm telling you, my mama grew up in this church. That's my mama's pew right over there, see? Got out, and that's my family's pew right over there. You see, it got the name right on it. And so this is the way we've always done it. You have to prepare. In, 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 you're preparing yourself, and then you're preparing leaders. So listen, as leaders, because this is a leadership summit, as leaders, you're being prepared to move the church forward in terms of the will of God and the purposes of God. There has to be this preparation. Are you prepared for your favorite thing to be eliminated. You have to prepare the department heads, prepare the people, uh, and listen, teach them, have them to pray about the change. What I found out and uh, what people aren't informed on, generally they're down on. What they're not informed on, they're just, they're down on it. It's just the nature of it. And so you'll find that you have people who are early adopters, people who will just, you know, pick it right up. Then you have some who, you know, they'll, they'll come in a little bit slower. And then you, you have people that, that, that are resistant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just, 
you know, and they'll stand over there. I shall not be moved <laughs> like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I shall not be moved. You know, and, and so you have to make sure that you're praying because it isn't like the devil's going to say, okay, go ahead, discover life. You all make as many disciples as you can. Go ahead, whatever the name of your church is, New, new Vision. Go ahead, make disciples. I, I'm the devil. I'm just going to get out the way. You'll, you'll find that some of the very people that you were in the meeting with <laughs> were sitting there and go, you know what, I heard him. I don't know if we're going to do that, Reverend. <laughs> so, <laughs> being churches, I've been, been in all kinds of churches, and, um, you know, I, the, the pastor in the ch church that I was in, that I grew up in, would be the moderator of the business meeting. They didn't call them pastor, they called them brother moderator. And, uh, and when things weren't going right, they, they said, rather than us change, we'll get rid of you. And so I've been in the meeting where they said, brother moderator, I make a motion that the pulpit be declared vacant. <laughs> and the moderator standing up here, well, it's been motion that the pulpit be declared vacant. Do I hear a second? Somebody said, second. He said, well, it's been all in favor, I uh, let, it be, let the eyes have it. Let it be known that the pulpit has been declared vacant. I said, he moderated his own firing. So, <laughs> listen to this. You have to prepare yourself, prepare leaders to prepare the people. You have to prepare the facility. You have to look at what you have and see, is, is this being optimally used for the purposes of making disciples? Well, you know, this is our room right here. We have this room, and every time we come to church, this is our room. Well, we need it. We, no, this is our room. And this I, I, this is Ava room. We have this Ava room. Are you hear what I'm saying? The Ava room. I pay. I have. I pay, 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 pay paint on this wall right here. I bought paint from Home Depot and put it on that. You see that paint on that wall? I put it on that wall. And see, people become territorial, and so you have to make sure that you're preparing the people, but then prepare the facility, whatever facility you're in. Because again, what are we trying to do? You see what I'm talking about? When everything is pointed toward making disciples, it begins to make sense. Right. Okay, now, now, prepare to answer questions also, not in a defensive way. No, don't question me, I'm the pastor. Oh, I'm the, I'm the head boot taker. You know, I'm, I'm the chief bottle washer around here. Don't you ever question me. No, 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 no. You, you answer questions and try to inform people so that people will be in on it. They'll, you, you'll give them the information that they need. So what we have so far is evaluation, communication, elimination, preparation. And here's the last one, implementation. Everybody say implementation. implementation. When we talk about implement, implementing, you implement the new strategy. New strategy. This is, this is, this is how we're going to be doing things. <laughs> Then you implement the new structure and you implement the new systems. Implement a new strategy, a new structure, and new systems. Implement new strategy, new structure, and new systems. Because, listen to me, if you do, if you try to have this new focus of making disciples and you start doing stuff the old way, you'll never get to where you need to get. So there has to be new ways of doing things. Now, don't be like a bull in a china shop. You're tearing up everything. Yeah. But you have to, listen to this, uh, you have to make sure that you are properly implementing things. I watch HGTV with my wife. <laughs> and what I found out of uh, the many, 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 many hours of watching <laughs> HGTV <laughs> with her is um, when, when they do... When they start doing um, uh, improvements or, uh, or open, like they said, we want an open concept room. One of the things they're going to come in and find out, the, the, the engineer is going to want to find out, is this wall a load-bearing wall? 
And so what you, when you're looking at it, when you're looking at making changes, you have to look at who is load-bearing. What's load-bearing around here? Because if you remove something that's load-bearing, everything that was on it is going to fall. <laughs> Look at the people and find out, are they load-bearing people? And what, what I found out in watching HG and TV is <laughs> that you have to put, it, if you have a load-bearing wall, there's a way to open the wall up. What they'll do is put in a support beam. Across, and that support beam will go un, undergo a stress test to see if it can handle the new lo, handle the load that's on it. And generally, it should exceed the amount in terms of uh, pounds and all that that's put on the pressure that's put on it. And they would put a beam on this side, uh, a support beam on this side. Uh, uh, put the put the uh, I'm sorry, put studs on this side, and then put the support beam. Studs on this side, put the support beams to hold it up. Then they begin to move the old wall. So when you're looking at old ministries, old system, you're trying to implement. Is brother right here a, a support beam? And I got to look at who's attached to it. Because if I move him too soon, what I find out is if, he, if he's not on board, can we really talk? Everybody attached to him will be against what we're trying to do, and he will just walk out not knowing what has transpired. You, you following what I'm saying? And the next thing you know, you'll find this whole section of the ministry has fallen because you've not provided the proper structure. <laughs> us for no more so 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 what we have to make sure of is that this thing is properly structured and as the structure is in place what you'll find is yeah we can move forward you we can move forward and 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 everything will be supported properly you can remove the old and it's fine you can begin to do that implementation process so I'm implementing the new strategy, the new structure, and the new systems. That has to happen. That has to happen. Practical advice. Pace yourself. Pace yourself. Real practical. Everybody say pace yourself. Pace yourself. Don't try to do everything at one time. Pace yourself. And then be thorough. I heard Doc... Uh, uh, Dr. Ivy Hilliard said this. He said, as big as New Light is, he said, when they're making a real change, they work on one area of ministry at a time yes. and make sure that they go through it and it's thorough in terms of the changes that they're making, that whatever they want to do, it's thorough so that you won't have to go back to it. Okay? Now, keep it simple. Everybody say keep it simple. When it, what you're doing, it has to be user-friendly. It has to be so that you, you're pacing yourself, you're being thorough, you're keeping it simple, user-friendly. People can understand. If people don't, you try to get so deep, people don't do deep. Deep is impressive to other folk, but you can't do deep. I'm glad Jesus didn't, you know, salvation isn't complicated. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, uh, uh, Brother Moderator, I don't know about all that. I think we got to make this thing more complicated. No, no. <laughs> Keep it simple. And listen to this. Show everyone their role. Show everyone their role. What we have to do is make sure that everybody who's attached to the ministry, who's a part of the ministry, can see themselves and what they're doing in terms of the key focus, making disciples, making followers of Jesus Christ. What is the music ministry's role? Well, I want them to create an atmosphere so that it's easy to meet God. 
What is the discipleship ministry's role? They're the ones who ground people in the Word of God. What is evangelism's ministry role? They're the ones who reach people for, for the Lord. What is the administrative you know, ministry's role? What do they do? They got to make sure the business of the church is right so we can facilitate that thing. They keep taking care of the facili facilities. What is the minister's role? They're providing care and teaching, etc. And so everybody begins seeing their role and seeing, okay, I'm a part of this whole disciple-making process. Now, are we perfect at it? No. Long way to go. We're working on it. We're getting there. We've made some progress. But we have to make, sh make sure that we're showing everybody their role. And the last thing I want to say is this. Stick to it. Stick to it. The temptation is going to be changed to change it. Go back. Go back to the old way. Go back to the old way. It used to be that, uh, that you know, what we, what we used to do, you know, it was just... It worked. I'm familiar with that. And it's so easy to go back to the familiar. Yes. Familiar. Um, I want to tell you, I said I wanted to, I felt like three inches from a prophecy. <laughs> I really believe that, I, I declare to you that as you begin to take upon this mandate, this assignment to make disciples of Jesus Christ, you're going to begin to go on a journey with him like you've never seen before. His power will be there to do everything necessary to implement his will. Are you, are you hearing me? God, I, I, he, he spoke this to me. He said, son, there's nothing that I won't give you to do what I ask you to do. Everything that you have in terms of an assignment from Jesus, there's great provision to get it done. I submit to you that could it be the provision has been held up because you haven't gotten on the right assignment. Yes. And God's trying to make a shift on the inside of you so that it becomes more than just I do my church thing. I'm doing my church thing. What I'm doing, I'm making sure that we're on board with Jesus. We're doing what he said for us to do. When he comes back and he said, did you wash the dishes? And we say, yes, sir. I washed the dishes. I did what you asked for me to do. In other words, I made disciples. I obeyed you. I fulfilled the assignment for you. We used to, the old deacons used to sing a hymn, a line, this line hymn. It says, a charge to keep I have a God to glorify, a never dying, ever dying soul to save that's fitted for to the sky, to serve this present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may my powers engage, may all my powers engage to do my master's will. And so God will empower you and grace you to do what it is he wants you to do. You, you're looking for a new strength, you're looking for a new energy. My friend, I'm telling you, He'll come in and do some amazing things for you. Amen? Amen. Let's thank the Lord for that.